This episode of Fuel for the Soul is powered by ASICS. Head over to ASICS.com and sign up for a one ASICS account. It's completely free, and when you sign up, you will receive 10% off your first purchase. You'll also gain access to exclusive colorways on ASICS.com, free standard shipping, special birthday month discounts, and more. This is Thomas with Believe in the Run. This is Megan with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Featherstone Nutrition. AKA Feathers. And this episode is brought to you by Suck It, the straw that you can put in something. <laughs> okay, it sure isn't. <laughs> I'm glad we're still talking about that. <laughs> Megan, I heard that uh, people were into it. Oh, you have no clue how many DMs I got about straws. And apparently, I had to go back and listen because I was like, what did we even say about straws? I mean, I knew it was like the cups, but apparently we were saying you should be able to then eat your straw. So apparently that exists. Twizzlers make straws. Yeah, that's like a candy. That. Yeah. So people were sending that and I was like, oh, that's Yeah, but that's going to be sticky. That's not going to work Very. for me because that's going to be sticky. What yeah. I need is something that's more like, have you ever had those dry cookies that are yes. like Italian? <laughs> And it's like a straw. They're yes. like really crunchy. So yeah. I want a straw like that. And that's got the yeah. carbs, got the stuff. Yeah. Deliciousness. Mm-hmm. Usually it's chocolate in the center. <laughs> I'm dead. I mean, if it's going to have fat dessert chocolate, out there, it's probably I okay. <laughs> I mean, Thomas, like if anybody's going to try it, it's going to be you. So yeah, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let's get to what we're actually talking about today, which is not edible straws, believe it or not. We're going to talk a little bit about recovery, um, which is a timely topic because a lot of people have just run a fall marathon. Like New or, York City? Yeah. Um, or some some race. And so Indianapolis. It's, so anyway, it's it's timely. I mean, this is a good thing. I just want to ask you a question for both of you guys. You, you guys run multiple marathons this year. Megan, you're on New York City will be your what marathon this year? Five? Oh. Okay. Uh, how many How many have you done this year, Megan Featherston? I mean, you laughed uh, yeah. way too hard at that. Ridiculous. Am I right? Uh, <laughs> it's been five. I thought it was like three. I think mine's only, this will be three, right? Yeah. I just did right. Boston. Yeah. Oh, Berlin. So you're normal? New York yeah. City. Very, Well, no, very that's. Normal. I think that's ridiculous too. Like I think, I think of normally... Maybe I would squeeze two in in the fall, but this year I've got three, and I didn't remember that I had done two in the spring. That's how long yeah. this year has seemed. But well, uh, we've done some crazy stuff with doing two in this. For me, I'll do two in the spring, so I'm looking at it as like four in a very short period. Like I'm kind of yeah. not doing like a calendar year. I'm like, there's I need to be careful. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. So, but with that, you know, people now. I think there's a couple of reasons why this isn't as ludicrous as it used to be in the past. One, our shoes are more cushioned. You're coming out a little bit better. But two, people are finding out about nutrition and ways to to recover. And I think that, you know, we owe that all to Megan Featherston and Featherston Nutrition. I don't know if you've been recognized by the World Health Organization or anybody else for providing this kind of information to runners. But, uh, I mean, you tell me. It's the feathers effect, quite frankly. It's just trickling. No, it would be really funny. I like to th- take credit for like all of it. Like when somebody was like, Target's out of graham crackers. I'm like, well, it was me. <laughs> or Trader Joe's <laughs> doesn't have graham crackers anymore. I'm like, well, I'd like to take claim for that, obviously. I can't. But it would be really interesting to see like how much this effect has, you know, really kind of trickled around. And I think we're seeing that. People are certainly catching on that they understand the importance of solid nutrition, not just for performance, but for recovery and decreasing injury risk. So I think we're, we're doing the Lord's work here, folks, and we're changing the tide here. Um, and I really do think we're seeing people intuitively fueling very different than we did, even just three or four years ago, um, which is really cool. Yeah, that is awesome. Okay, so this, this study came out, and it is the metabolic recovery of marathon runners. So... First of all, what is metabolic recovery? And then what was this study and what did we find out? 
So this study is like wicked in the weeds. So we're going to take a very high level approach to it. But what they did was there was 15 marathon runners and they tested them before, after, 24 hours after, and 48 hours after. And they literally tested for every single metabolite that they could find, which a metabolite is just a byproduct of our metabolism. So what they were looking for is things that were depleted, things that... um would allow us to figure out exactly what substrates would we need to ingest or change, you know, it's not all about nutrition, right, in order to speed up that recovery. So they're literally looking okay, for so like... Okay, so dumb guy question real quick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you say metabolite, <laughs> um, and you said that's anything that we can measure. One of the things we know we measure is glucose. We measure uh, sodium and that kind of stuff, magnesium, all that stuff, are those all metabolites? Um, not necessarily. So I put a picture so in our yeah, thing. Can you give me some? If you can in, see my computer. document, but people can't see it. I can, I know I'll people can't see that. Video. But so what it's looking at is like when we metabolize um, substrates into energy, right? Whether it's carbs, fat, you know, whatever is entering our energy pathways, it's going to spit out byproducts as part of that metabolism. So it's looking at some of those things to try to figure out like what is deficient in these folks, what um, different areas could we be supplementing. So they're trying to figure out like are there truly certain things that we could give to endurance athletes to help them recover faster after some of these things. But they're just, you know, like I said, very much in the weeds of what they're pulling to figure that out. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt again and say, I'm in the middle of my run right now. I can't look at Meg's chart on the video. <laughs> Can you just tell me some of these things? <laughs> well, if anybody had to take biochemistry, this chart, I had, I put it in here. It's so small. No one can read it just because I think it's hilarious for you guys to like see it. But it's looking at all the different energy pathways in our bodies and the different metabolites that are spit out from them. And it is so, I mean, it's like circles and, and twisty turnies and there's all different colors that's saying that this one has to do with glycogen stores and this one has to do with gut microbiota and like all this different stuff. So it's, this is just to show you like how technical this study really got but obviously we're going to blow it up and look at some of the bigger picture you know items that came okay from it. so for nerds like you this was pretty exciting <laughs> i honestly i was like <laughs> i only have an hour to review this i don't have a day because it's literally i think it would take days to really get in the weeds of all of it yeah um okay so what did if we can look at sort of mm-hmm. like a high level were there any like shocking or key takeaways from it And that's exactly what they did. So they found there was like 26 different metabolites that you significantly fluctuated over the um, recovery period. So then they're like, all right, we need to zone in on these and kind of quantify them or bucket them, if you will. So the different buckets that they found that we could improve upon from a recovery standpoint, um, one of them is looking at like cellular ATP levels, like nutrition's probably not going to touch that, right? That's literally how we make energy from the food we eat. So that's a little bit. That sounds like a metabolite. Right, exactly. But the the two that were super, or actually three that were super interesting for all of us to kind of look at was one of them was refilling our glycogen stores. So they were saying how important mm. it is to get extra carbohydrates in to recover faster after a marathon, which we, you know, we preach about all the time on here. And, you know, going back to if that was your goal race, do we have to restock them like super, super quickly, which we've said before, maybe not, right? But that was certainly one of the things that they found. And then another one was, this one was pretty interesting because they're still kind of like, I don't know what to do with this one. But they found that there's certain amino acids that we might need in higher doses to repair. So they were finding that there was like some deficiency of certain amino acids in the recovery process. But we've talked here before that like, is supplementing a single amino acid or taking branch chain amino, like, is that even helpful or should we just make sure we're eating enough protein? So my takeaway from this was like- That's a a protein thing, right? Right. It's a muscle breaking Mm -hmm. thing. So, I mean, again, I feel like if, if nothing else, this study just really verified that we're on the right track here by making sure we're eating carbs, we're eating enough protein. Like protein is probably the biggest piece of recovery that this research found, that we just need to make sure that we're getting an adequate protein at least three times a day, maybe four times a day after a big effort like a marathon to just make sure that we're recovering those muscles. Okay, so can we, can we put this into practical terms real quick? Mm-hmm. All right, you, we just finished the New York City Marathon. And my first instinct is to just go have a celebration, whatever. 
And sometimes I'm not even hungry because I've been exercise. Like, you know, you get that weird, I've been exercising, I'm not hungry. And I mm-hmm. just had 45 gels. <laughs> right. Yeah. Die. Don't feed me. <laughs> That's what my body says. <laughs> like, please stop. Yeah. <laughs> but so we go counterintuitive to what our body's telling us. What would the following? So say, I mean, New York's a weird one because you end uh, at all different times. So somebody could be ending in at three o'clock in the afternoon. But for let's just say for a typical marathon. You're out there, say max five hours. It starts at seven. What's the rest of your day look like? I mean, ideally, I wish they had like a cold, really tasty protein drink in the line that you go through as you're leaving. Like milk, it's okay, but it doesn't have quite enough protein, right? But like I really wish, and plus or sometimes when they do have like a higher protein drink, it's warm and you're like, absolutely not, mm-hmm. you know? So I mean, ideally, if I was planning a race, there would be like a really solid like 30 gram protein shake on ice for runners to take as they leave. I think that would be amazing. Who makes that stuff? Like, would that be like Insure? Insure makes one. Like, yep. What are some um, of the brands that like, because you could put a cooler in your car and have it's it. It's true. You know? It's true. Yeah. Insure Max makes like a 30 gram protein one. And then um, like Core Power is a really popular one. The Fairlife brand. Um, Meg and I had them on our tour this summer. Um Mm-hmm. They're pretty good. And then... You liked it? It was really good. Yeah, what it was tasted it like... Uh, Fair Life? I think right? we picked Fair the Fair Life Is that Life dairy? One. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. It tastes like melted ice cream, though. It was delicious. Um, yeah. I love melted ice cream. Yeah, you would love it. it was <laughs> he really would like good. it. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. It, I have a lot of clients that use Was those. it cold when you had it? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. immediately, whether you can buy one of these products or get something like the Scratch Protein or... Mm-hmm. Uh, momentous there's tons of proteins out there if you could just get down some immediate liquid protein getting right to your stomach and getting right into your digestive system Mm -hmm. that would be ideal for right after the race Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like a protein bar right like in berlin i didn't have any shakes and i couldn't find one so i just had one of those rise protein bars that you and i both like you know before i hopped in the shower but i had one today (laughs) i had half of one i don't know why i had a half one open in here yeah i had one today i didn't feel like doing a shaker (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So you could do something like that, too, if you don't have a cold beverage of protein. Um, and then, of course, like a meal then as your stomach starts to settle down, right? Like a couple What would be like later. an ideal meal? I mean, you need protein and you want some carbs and probably some salt. Like all of us were just saying, we've taken all these sweet gels. I mean, you know that's our jam. A good old mm-hmm. cheeseburger yeah. a couple hours after the race. Yeah. How important is this timing? Like, let's say you don't want to eat for a while mm-hmm. and you you wait a couple hours is it like detrimental to wait a couple hours before you get in that protein or like how important is the timing piece so i don't think we know for sure like i would love to see like a head-to-head study of like looking at these metabolites and someone who did everything like we know we should be doing versus somebody who was a little more lax about it you know it would be interesting in that this study didn't look at that specifically i mean I think we've all been there in both directions. And like personally, I'm like, did it change my recovery? I don't think so. I still feel like it took me the same you know, amount of time to recover. So I guess some people might be different. Maybe it's different as we get older and those types of things. Um, That's what I was going to ask you because you, you talk about protein needs as someone gets older. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that it's going to be it might be one of those things that's more valuable the older the person is to, mm-hmm. to recoup and, and restock. Um, where is, I mean, we all know, even with hangovers, the younger you are, <laughs> the faster you pop back and you hit a certain right. age and all right. of a sudden everything takes a little bit longer. So maybe it's like that. Mm-hmm. It could be like that. And the one thing we know for sure as we get older is it takes more protein to do that recovery process. So we know that for sure. So maybe that 30 grams isn't enough as we start to get older. Um, okay. So we know we have to get in our protein and then Carbs are, you're saying, not quite as important, but they are still important to... Um, Rebuilding your glycogen stores. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just... It's what about not... sodium and stuff like that? So that was one thing that they didn't pull out in Bucket was anything with hydration, which was interesting. Not that that's not important, um, you know, but that that's... I just thinking of that now, as you said this, it didn't cross my mind until then. Um, but obviously, 
that's going to help with the recovery process because all of these substrates that we're talking about are carried different places with fluids. So if we're dehydrated, like, right, muscle soreness is going to be increased. We'll talk in a minute about the other bucket of like GI, you know, intestinal um, damage, right? Like if we're dehydrated, that's going to get worse, that kind of stuff. So certainly the hydration piece is super important for recovery too. Hopefully. Yeah, so if I didn't if I didn't want to eat a lot, but I at least could get some fluids in and maybe some electrolytes, like mm-hmm. that's going to be beneficial versus for sure. doing nothing. I yeah. have a feeling it's like one of those things like, you know, when they say like 10 minutes of exercise is better than zero exercise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm going to guess that anything you get into your system mm-hmm. is going to help with the recovery process. But obviously, if you check in this chart, it's showing you the deficit that you have to refill. Right. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and then I have a question, and I, you probably don't know the answer, but I'm just curious. Like, how much does this help recovery? Like, are we talking like I'm going to be better the next day versus I'm not going to feel good for four days, or like, is there any like quantifiable time period of how much this helps? Well, and I think that's probably the next step from this research, right? Was they were just evaluating what was happening at one right after one day after two days after, you know, and they were finding that there was still some deficits and things that needed fixed. So if we can figure out how to speed up fixing those, then how long does it take us to recover? You know, so um, and that, this is like the same thing with evaluating performance in research research studies is that we there's so many factors. It's like how in the world can we say like that was the factor, that was it. It's just such a huge picture, which is why we do the things we know in theory should work. And we, you know, try to see like how extreme do we personally need to get with those things in order to recover at the speed we want to recover. All right. But like say that you are chronically deficient in these areas because right now it's it's measuring after a hard Mm -hmm. effort but Mm -hmm. if a person was chronically low in these areas or you know the or i guess you'd measure some high even um Mm -hmm. uh you know depending on what the uh result is but if is it going to result in injury is it going to result in like are we going to see muscle tear muscles not building that kind of stuff if if uh you remain low on all these? Yeah. So we do know that if we don't get adequate protein for the recovery process, that, yeah, we lose muscle mass and that we drastically increase our risk of injury when we are, again, coming back from, you know, back to whatever discipline we're doing for us running. Um, And, you know, it's not like, oh, my gosh, I didn't eat protein one day. I'm screwed. You know, it's like a long-term thing, right? We see people who switch to, like, either more plant-based diets and aren't educated on getting enough protein. We see that they end up with some injuries that are very much related to muscles not recovering and that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I think there's certainly a a piece of of that with the recovery process. It's just kind of hard to – really put numbers and days and hours like kind of like Meg was asking to it. Well, we, I think we always talk about like when you look at marathon training, you know, the recommended is take two weeks off afterwards from running or to do that. And we kind of all do it, but we, or try to do it. (laughs) But, uh, is that like, where are we getting this information? Like where, cause I just take it for granted. Like I don't even think about it. I'm like, okay, it makes sense. I just finished a, hard effort marathon take a couple weeks off um i mean there's different theories on that too there's people that say for every mile you need to take a day off which is you'd have to take 26 days off for the marathon to quote fully recover but you could not run five marathons in a year (laughs) with that philosophy she'd be at five months out of business yeah (laughs) i love it yeah i don't know i don't know some of that is just like I, I, nobody's testing that or, or really talking about. Well, it. and like we, mm-hmm. when we were talking at the top of this, it's like you have the shoes, you have this new information on nutrition. Like there's faster ways to recover, mm-hmm. and so that is probably not necessary anymore. I mean, one of my mm-hmm. favorites is Epsom salt baths. Mm. Yep. I don't. I haven't gotten into that. Should I get into that? You should get into that. Okay, <laughs> Megan's resisted. She's always resisted. And I've always been like Megan. It's the way. Yeah. And you and you did one, didn't you like it? I, I've done a bunch. I never. I don't. You're making this up. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so many. Um, okay, the bucket we haven't really talked about here is the GI health part. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about that. 
Yes. So I loved that they put this in here because I I honestly, I would say 50% of the people I work with are coming to me with some sort of GI issue from running. So we've talked about this a lot on here, but truthfully, when we are running a marathon or even training over the summer, especially in the heat, we just don't get good blood flow to our GI tract. So we know that we don't get good perfusion, aka blood, to our GI tract. So we have a little bit of an insult to our GI tract. So this was measuring some of the, the markers that would say like, yo, your intestine is pissed off right now, right? So we've known, they've done some studies where they've looked at this and they've looked at like how long some of these biomarkers are high from intestinal damage after running and it's like at least 24 hours. And then the cool part was is there's another study that looks at when is this the worst and it's when people get too hot which is exactly what we see, right? We see so many people with more GI issues over the summer as they're training in hot conditions because the perfusion is even worse to our GI tract at that point. And then they did, this one study did have some runners who collapsed and they had like the worst GI (laughs) issues. So I was like, well, that makes sense, right? Like heat illness. Um, So I think it's, it's, it's another important part of this recovery process, right? Like a lot of our immunity and a lot of our overall health is in our GI tract. So we need to make sure that we're rehydrating, like we talked about before, to make sure that we're not putting any further insult to our GI tract. And then maybe we'll see that there's a place to really make sure that we're eating some of those more, you know, high probiotic rich foods like yogurt and kefir and sauerkraut and um, kombucha and those types of things to like help our body rebuild that a little bit. There's not enough research now to be like, hey, go take a probiotic. Um, But it is, you know, it's interesting to see that like a marathon is no joke on our body and there's like lots of different areas is that we have to focus on to, to recover. I like that you call it insulting your GI tract because I think like mama jokes. Your mama, so you know. I, I'll have to your intestine's so screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the heat related <laughs> issues, I just assumed those were dehydration, but are those two separate things? Like the heat in itself also just affects GI issues? They're, yeah, and obviously they come along together sometimes, but the heat in and of itself, like to cool our body, we're going to take more blood flow to our skin, right, to cool our body. So that's just the heat in general. And then once we get dehydrated, we have like a lower blood volume, so there's not as much going to our GI tract to keep it healthy. Um, so yeah, it just gets a little mad for kind of a lot of us. So I think it's just interesting that they pulled that one specifically out Um of kind of what they were researching, not just the glycogen, not just the protein and muscle yeah. recovery, but kind of looking at the more holistic picture of like, how do we heal our body after we put it through a marathon? And do we fully heal our body? Like we're doing all this damage, and but it's not permanent, right? Like yeah. we come mm-hmm. back and have normal functioning, everything. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, if you're somebody who's like continuously having chronic GI issues, like obviously get a doctor involved, not just be like, oh, Megan, <laughs> Megan, Megan and Thomas said this is normal. Um, you know, mm-hmm. everyone has their limit of what normal is. But um, yeah, no, the research shows that like it all goes back to normal. Like all of these, you know, things that they're measuring go back to normal at some point. And if you think about it, like the average marathon runner is probably but maybe I'm stereotyping this, but like significantly healthier than the average human, right? So like we're going to kind of have a little bit better recovery overall from all this kind of stuff. Um, Okay, we talked a lot about protein, the importance of getting that in, carbs, the importance of that. Is there, and like, what is fat for? Is there, is it do any good for us? (laughs) What is fat for? You know, (laughs) poor fat, we leave it out a lot. Um, It's super important, but fat comes along with our carbs. It comes along with our protein. So most of us just get enough fat in our daily diet um, to kind of balance out what we need. And really the biggest thing of fat is is we need a certain amount of fat for healthy hormone production. So we know that like if we don't eat fat or we're like on a really low fat diet, like it screws with our hormones. So I mean, that's the most important piece with the fat. But like, honestly, I can think of just a handful of people that I had to be like, hey, make sure you're getting your fat in. Like the majority of us are just kind of getting it already. Now, we do have some fats that are more anti-inflammatory, which could potentially help with recovery. So like fatty fish, nuts, seeds, avocados, that type of stuff. Like maybe we want to be more intentional or throw some chia seeds into our protein shake, you know, to try to balance that out. Like that would probably be a good idea from a recovery standpoint. All right. So let's talk about two different scenarios here. One is someone just finished a marathon, they're normal, and then they're going on with their life and recovering and not running a bunch second scenario this person is a little bit nutty and has another race coming up 
What are the differences that those two people need to be thinking about? <laughs> Who are these Wait, nutty tell me people? This again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do, what do you tell the nuts? Thing. They sound horrible. But we tell the nuts, <laughs> don't do as we do. Don't go out to the bar. No, I'm kidding. Um, so the most important thing would be to have that, what am I going to eat immediately after the race planned out? So do you have a protein bar? Do you have a protein shake? Um, like really try to get on top of that as soon as you can and then get that first meal in. And then if you do want to celebrate with some some drinks, some beverages, make sure you've gotten like at least two of those quote unquote doses of protein in to start that recovery process so that it doesn't negatively doses impact your Doses before mimosas. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so proud. <laughs> and then That's of course, the rehydrating jokes. faster. Carbs would be more important for those people because you're probably jumping back into training in four or five days instead of taking two weeks off. So we want to restock those glycogen stores. So like every same concepts are important, but we just want to like escalate them as far as like timing and just make them even a little more front and center just to make sure that we're recovering faster. All right. So we have a question from Skiddlybop. Emily. She said, hello, I love your podcast. A joy to listen to during my runs. I have historically not cared for traditional protein shakes, not caring for the milky and thick texture. About a year ago, I heard about a locally new company called Seek, producing a clear fruity whey protein drink. Um, I have tried most of their flavors to date and like them for the exception of the lemonade flavor, which was seasonal in 2022. I would like to continue to incorporate into my recovery regimen, but I'm concerned that the powder isn't certified by any organizations you suggest. Thoughts? Maybe they would send you some samples to try. <laughs> um, okay, so one, not every protein powder is going to be certified, right? Who needs a certified protein powder? One, people who are being tested for drugs, right? Like drugs. the elite athletes, 100% need to be making sure that all their stuff is certified. Because that would suck if you were taking a bag of EPO. That would really stink <laughs> in like, protein powder form. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear. I think that's how it is. I've been works. injecting it right in. <laughs> Um, so that's first and foremost. And then second is like if you're worried about potential cross-contamination, like if that's something that's interesting to you, right? So sometimes we see that like inadvertently something is slipped Nuts. into this, right? Or we do have some studies that show uncertified protein powders actually don't have as much protein as the label states. So those would be the two risks, right? Like contamination or it actually not having 22 grams of protein like it says. Yeah. So, you know, we all weigh our risk, you know, threshold here. So (laughs) weigh our risk threshold here. So, um, I mean, that's what she would look at. So, you know, we pulled up this protein and I have never heard of it, but it looks like instead of like a creamy base, it's more like Kool-Aid like or scratch yeah. you know something like that instead i yeah. get that but isn't like the part of like okay so when you get whey protein it's isolated from dairy right mm-hmm. so it's coming from milk or or mm-hmm. it's animal mm-hmm. so to refine it down to a clear like yeah non-dairy tasting powder you have to be really working that Like, it's got to be really processed. I would think so. It says it's whey protein isolate, which isolate is like the most fully broken down protein. And so they'll take out like the lactose. So it's like the most elemental type of whey protein, if that makes sense. So maybe they've taken out enough of the stuff that it it shakes up as clear. I, yeah, that's a really good question because you're right. Like none of the ones that we shake up are ever clear. I've tried some clear protein supplements and I think they are wretched, but she said she's tried it and it's good. So like if she likes it, you know, more power to you. Well, I'm Um, guessing like you can mask it with these fruit flavors. mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, I, I, like if you put caffeine, if you've tasted caffeine, it's horrible, (laughs) but you put it in a sugary gel, like that's not, that's good. Or in coffee. I love it. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the things that Emily would want to think about is just check out, like, you know, weigh the pros and cons. And if this is the only way you're getting your protein, I guess I would probably personally maybe take the risk. I don't know. Do you think the pea, pro- the pea protein is just as good as the whey protein? Like From momentous, yes. Stuff? From okay. just like a regular pea protein probably won't have enough leucine to be comparable. Like plant-based proteins typically are 
inferior because they don't have as much leucine. But a lot of these more sport-based companies like Momentus or Garden of Life Sport or Vega Sport add back in the leucine that is missing so that it's a very it's it's equal to a whey protein powder. So you just want to get a sport so can type we, one. Sure. Can we get controversial here for a second? Yeah. Never. As a nutritionist, you see all types of diets. Mm-hmm. Vegetarian, <laughs> vegan, omnivores, everything. Do you think that our body is naturally set up for an omnivore diet and that the way that our body synthesizes nutrients, it, 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 cause it, it's weird to me that the protein, the animal proteins seem to be the easiest for our bodies to digest and convert into muscle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like ethics so aside, right? Like on science. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like ethics aside, I understand those pieces for a lot of people. I'll use myself as an example. I actually do not like animal protein. I don't like chicken. I don't like turkey, but I eat it. So I think that answers your question. Like I do. I agree. I think it's easier to recover. I think it's easier to meet our protein needs if we're using those higher quality animal source proteins. That doesn't mean that we can't do it other ways, but I think, you know, if you're using me as an example, I actually don't even enjoy these things, but I'm like, well, that's what works here. So, you know, I try to find a way to include them. Yeah, I I do think it's, I know people are vegetarian and vegan for all different reasons, Mm -hmm. Um, but it does seem like if you just go with the way that our body naturally absorbs things, it seems like we were set up, at least evolutionarily, to eat animals. I just could never exist. I could never meet my protein needs with the amount of fiber that comes along with. Like, I, it would just be a disaster. So I, I, that's another reason. I'm like, I just could not do it. Like, my stomach would hate me. (laughs) All right. So we have another question from a listener. Um, I don't, I didn't write down their name. I'm sorry. Fred. Uh, But they said, I love your show and have been listening from day one. Wow. That's That's amazing. Um, thanks, thanks for, for all here. your helpful info. I've come across <laughs> wait, many we could, articles. We could probably track down who this is. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one. It's yeah. your mom. <laughs> um, I've come across many articles about the new research surrounding alcohol consumption. On one hand, it seems so simple. Stop drinking. On the other hand, our ancestors have been drinking alcohol for thousands of years. Can it really be that harmful? I mean, red wine is one of the common factors in the blue zones. I'm always skeptical when new research comes out. I'm looking at you, keto diet and frat, fat-free <laughs> snack wells. I would love your thoughts on the research, especially how a couple of glasses of wine, red, red wine. I think she meant red wine. Relate mm-hmm. to running and recovery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the age-old question, right? Like, how much is too much from a recovery standpoint? So, you know, I think obviously this is a personal choice whether we drink or not. We know that. Um, but you're right. Like we've mentioned it before on the show that there's a lot of people that are taking the stance of like a hard no. Like, no, if you want to be a good runner, if you want to recover, like no alcohol, you know. And I think the three of us are a little more realistic that like people are going to drink if they want to drink. So let's make sure that we're doing this well, in some the people most supportive run way. So that they can Right. Maybe have a beverage guilt free. Like there are people out there that are doing that. So, you know, I think if it's, it's again, we come in, it's that crossover between lifestyle and it's kind of like salt. Like we talk about, you shouldn't have so much sodium if you're sedentary and you're sitting on the couch. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it also comes down to like when we talk about, do you want to perform or like what do you want out of? This experience. But in terms of like recovery mm-hmm. and like and having some celebratory beverages after a big race, like is that do you think that's detrimental? I think depending on how it's positioned and how much is consumed, yes, it probably slows down recovery. But to our point, like that's a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice not to eat protein for a day after a race if you don't want to. It's a conscious choice. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, I think it would slow down recovery. The ways to minimize it slowing down recovery is 
to get your protein in first, to get your car, like eat, right? We, there's good research to show like eat before you drink something after a race and it won't impact recovery as much, right? And then of course, like try to stay hydrated throughout it as well. But I mean, we've hung out after enough races here and I think everybody who listens knows what we do sometimes after races here. And again, like if that's a piece of how we celebrate and we are grown adults and if that's how we choose to do it and if that means that recovery is delayed a day, that's a choice that we're making, right? Um, but I don't, you know. I mean, you also have to probably throw in the factor of sleep is as recovery. It's going yeah. to interrupt your sleep. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about, do you have any thoughts on this idea that red wine is actually a beneficial, beneficial. like oh. recovery beverage? Get- so as far as is red wine like healthy for us, we used to say yes. And now there's research that's like, no, no amount of alcohol is healthy, you know? And as Emily Oster mentioned on the drop, she's like, all this research is flawed. So <laughs> we should have her like fact check us <laughs> anyways. <Yeah. laughs> um, so I think is it is it healthy? Like we're pretty clear that like alcohol is not healthy, right? It's just like how harmful is it? And I would love to see like is there a higher threshold of harmful in someone who is incredibly physically active, right? Is it metabolized differently? Is the damage to different things in our body different? I don't know, you know? Like I think those are all things that maybe we don't know, don't research because researching alcohol is a little bit taboo for a lot of institutions. You know, we keep saying alcohol gets a bad rap that no amount is right. But I remember there was a study a little while ago that a little bit of drinking helps keep Alzheimer's away. Oh, that's right. Because my grandpa, who was Quaker, (laughs) who didn't believe in drinking, fighting, swearing, anything, started drinking red wine at age 94 because he was convinced he had Alzheimer's. We walked into his like assisted living and he had a bottle of menage a trois red wine. (laughs) Wow. I was going to die. I was like, grandpa? Like, I was like, did your lady friend leave this here last night? No way this is yours. And he's like, no, I have these tremors. And I read that. So, yes, there was that study. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's funny because... He, my father wasn't a drinker and his father wasn't a drinker, but my grandmother was and she outlived uh, my right? grandfather. It's <laughs> wild. That's... It's I wild. Think, I, I mean, and this goes back to like everything nutrition related, which is like how individualized it is. Like I know I can have several beverages and be okay. And I know I have friends that if they drank as much as I did, they would literally be on the floor. Right. And, I don't know what that says about metabolizing <laughs> things, but right. or alcohol tolerance, but like it's just so different. Do you think you mm-hmm. overestimate how many drinks you can have? <laughs> <laughs> Some days, <laughs> perhaps, but no. Um, yeah, and I think, like I said, like I have so many questions about alcohol and health that I just don't think are ever going to be answered. Like I have tons yeah. of questions, you know, that I don't think we have answered because it is. It's just one of those things that's like no amount is good, it you does, know. So it does seem to flip flop. I mean, I do <laughs> think emotionally for people, you can tell. I think there's a psychological um, benefit and a psychological non-benefit what would that be detriment i don't know Mm -hmm. i'm saying Mm -hmm. like you for sure i think that like there's been nights where i'll get home and i know i have a workout the next day or something but i'm just like you know i need to shut down i need to relax i'm gonna have a glass of wine with dinner Mm -hmm. and i have the one glass of wine i hydrate i do everything else it just it allows me to be like i'm not thinking about it if i do it so i'm i'm relaxed or whatever Mm -hmm. but on the flip side of that you know, if, if we go three, four days in a row of cocktails when we're entertaining or something like around the holidays or Thanksgiving or maybe just a regular week, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that you, I do notice that yeah. depression can kick in or at yeah. least my mind isn't operating in a, in a great yeah. way. Well, and I think I, this is I can compare this very easily to like using nutrition as a coping strategy, right? Like some people eat when they feel certain ways. Some people drink when they feel certain ways. And like I tell people about eating, it's it's okay that nutrition is one of your tools to cope with different feelings. It just can't be the only one, right? It's okay if we eat our feelings sometimes, right? Just like it's okay if we have a drink to calm down sometimes. It just can't be the only way that we know how to cope in life. I mean, that's my opinion, right? But, you know, what I do think... What flavor do you eat when you eat your feelings? <laughs> flavor do I eat? Oh, like salty or yeah. sweet? Or just what would be something... Say that you've had a rough day. Yeah. And you're Megan Featherston, worldwide yeah. Abbott you know, nutritionist. Um, and you're like, screw yeah. it. 
I'm gonna have one of these. I'm throwing it all to the it side. It used to always be sweet. Now I would say it's probably 50-50, but um, it was pro- like, honestly, probably would be like a bag of chocolate chips. Like would be that I would like eat chocolate chips out of a bag. Okay, I don't know where we were going with this conversation, but let's do a quick little like recap of someone just did their marathon. They need to recover quickly. What are the three things they should do ASAP? First and foremost, grab some hydration as you're walking through. Water, sports drink, whatever is there. Let's get back on top of hydration. Second, find your protein. So whether that's a shake or a bar or you can get to a meal quickly, which is probably not the case because we need to shower, get that protein in and then get to that meal that's got some protein. Get some carbohydrates in there. Even if you've carb loaded and you never want to see a carb again, we need those back, right? And then stay on top of that hydration. And then if you choose to have a celebratory beverage, that would be a great time to add it in is after you have done some hydration, protein twice, some carbs, get after it. So HPM. Hydrate, protein. Hydration, protein, meal. Meal. I was like, what's the M? He's got me on the M. Yeah. There you go. HPM. We're going to chant that instead of OTQ this time. Yeah, HPM. (laughs) HPM. HPM. So good. No, We'll have to come up with, uh, yeah, we'll come. Hip them. Hip them. It's not, it doesn't really roll off the tongue. We'll figure it out. Okay. We'll we'll figure something out. Yeah. I dig it. All right. Uh, That does it for this week. If you guys have a question that we have not answered, you can send us an email at fuelforthesoulpodcast at gmail.com and we will answer it here on the show. Um, And yeah, thanks for tuning in. But anyway, peas and carrots without an accent. Oh, wow. I can do it if you want. (laughs) Good (laughs) eye. I said no. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I can do it as a character too. Bye. 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 I am your peas and carrots. Dating um, you, Thomas, by bringing up Ep- Epsom salts. I feel like that is like a very like. I want y'all to practice. get in a hot bath. <laughs> no, no, it's actually I'm from the future. You guys have really made it. That means you've made it. If Morton's reaching out, I, <laughs> I didn't ask her. I just put down. I'm like she's about two stones. <laughs> <laughs> two stones. I don't even know what a stone is. <laughs> I don't either. A British people will know. That's none of this is going to the podcast. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> Your GI track is so stupid. It takes it over three hours to digest minute rice. Okay. Yeah, I can what see his happening? face turning in the background, really excited about something. That's no, what it, it was. Didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> okay. Again, again, right, another. <laughs> can I ask a question? Or Your you GI track so dumb, it thought Dunkin' Donuts was a basketball team. Get it? Okay. No. Okay. All right, Got it, Duncan. Get it. I went to the internet for these. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> the internet. What are you doing? What are we jamming out for here? <laughs> He's trying to pretend it's not him, like it's one of us. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me, I Shaggy. I put my phone down. You know, Robbie and I always, uh, we, we talk about if we find out someday that plants are sentient. And that they have emotions and feelings. It's really going to screw with people. Well, that was terrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. People are tagging us in peas and carrots now, too. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Someone called Thomas Peas and Carrots. Like, that's his name now.